Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of SOT TV. My name is Sonia Gavankar and I'm here to bring you everything you need to know about the first virtual SOT annual meeting and talks expo. Today we are going to be highlighting organizations and leading experts doing great work in the field of toxicology. SOT TV starts right now. Diversity, equity, and inclusion has always been a focus for the SOT to ensure that members know they are in a safe space. Let's take a closer look at what the SOT has done to open the doors in the field of toxicology for everyone. The Society of Toxicology has a really diverse demographic. We really welcome everyone. Um, and one of the ways that uh, we found people feel welcome is by having special interest groups or affinity groups of which we have eight now and these span anything from women in toxicologists to a hispanic organization of toxicologists to a recently formed out toxicologist and ally special interest group the special interest groups play a pretty important role within the society of toxicology community as a whole um, they provide a forum for bringing together scientists who share common interests and issues germane to the specific communities. The Women in Toxicology Special Interest Group, also known as WIT, which is a group that I've been a part of for many years, including serving in a variety of leadership positions, was the first SIG and was established back in 2001 to provide leadership for career development opportunities for women toxicologists to promote and recognize the accomplishment of women toxicologists, and to sponsor scientific and educational programs that advance women toxicologists as well. There's so many things that all of the component groups are engaged in. You know, there's, there's a plethora of opportunities, um, you know, to serve and to learn. And then as people in the leadership within the component groups observe you doing, they'll likely identify you as someone for leadership positions within the group. And as you gain experience with leadership within these groups, others in the society will begin to take notice as well. Our committees and our governing groups are a diverse group, making efforts to improve our diversity and our inclusion. This includes uh, over three decades worth of an undergraduate program where we've brought in over a thousand students from diverse backgrounds. I was coming from a historically black college and university, didn't really know what toxicology was and was afforded the opportunity to attend the talks and the education that they gave us. It was like, hey, I've actually been doing toxicology. I like this, this is really cool. So just in sitting around that table, a small group, there's like five of us undergrads, a couple of host mentors and a peer mentor, you know, they're asking questions and they're looking and talking to me as someone who would, could potentially be their colleague and offering to guide the course of my life so that I could be, a, I could become one of them. I think everybody was caused to reflect on things after the, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the subsequent unrest in our cities over the past several months as to whether SOT has been doing enough. So we actively sought feedback, first by having focus groups with selected Black members and Hispanic members of our society, just to, to hear how we're doing. And then a, a town hall where we invited everyone from the society. We are taking action on that in terms of having a new and we hope more inclusive mission statement as well as increasing activities in terms of diversity and demonstrating our commitment to diversity. Opening that space and saying, hey, we're, we're diverse, but maybe we're not always inclusive, especially when it comes to the reaches of volunteerism, like how do you actually be included in committees and things like that that people may not be aware of. And once you're in the room, is everyone being listened to? If there are issues they may not necessarily hear at their level, they become aware of it. And it also makes people feel good that they are giving an input to make their society better. I'm very excited in the direction that the society is going in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think what we all understand is that our society at large is changing and the society of toxicology needs to keep up in order to continue to grow and have the best science and the best scientists. 
and for us to be able to make the Society of Toxicology a place where everybody feels welcome and that they are valued most of all for their science is really what our goal is. As promised, we are going to be highlighting many organizations around the world that are leading in the field of toxicology. Today, let's start by taking a closer look into CN Bio's innovations. Their mission is to transform drug discovery through the development of disruptive systems that optimize the accuracy and productivity of bringing new medicines to market. CN Bio Innovations is a UK-based life sciences company. Our mission is to develop instruments and assays which provide human relevant and predictive information for the pharmaceutical industry. Using our physiomimics organ on chip technology, we've developed a number of drug metabolism and toxicological applications. For example, using our liver on a chip model, we can assess drug-induced liver injury. We do this by using a wide variety of different metrics and endpoints to assess cell health and cell damage. And in particular, we focus on the use of clinical biomarker endpoints to allow translational data to be generated. We also have models of the human lung and human intestine to assess toxicological effects in those organs. And then we can combine these organ models together in our multi-organ platforms to allow us to assess organ-organ crosstalk, metabolite-driven toxicity, and on and off target effects of particular compounds. Ultimately, I hope CM Bio can contribute to a future where drugs are discovered more quickly, brought to patients more cheaply, and through the use of less animal experimentation. Next, we head to India to take a look at a research organization providing end-to-end -end services to the biotech, pharmaceutical, biological, agrochemical, and cosmetic industries. All the people who are responsible for designing, synthesizing and screening are co-located. The knowledge transfer from discovery to development is seamless because it's all in the same campus. We have proven record of 70 plus IND programs and 20,000 GLP regulatory studies. Nigel Green from AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals joins us in studio today. Nigel, thanks for joining us. So what is really the power of AI? So I think I should start by saying that AI is not a new concept. AI has been around for the probably best part of 50 years, to be honest. Um, but the real power of AI comes from the ability for a machine to learn how to do one task, but do that task really, really well. Um, and that it gives us the ability to train an artificial intelligence system to perform the function that somebody else would have done or had to do manually, some human being to do. And so the power comes from our ability to automate some of the tasks. That's not to say that it will replace the human being in the, in the equation, but it's more that it makes them more efficient in their job. And so I think the real power and, and why we should harness it is, is it just makes us more efficient. How can AI become a resource in toxicology? That's a great question. And I think artificial intelligence is, is already being a resource in toxicology. I think if you look at areas where they're using uh, transcriptomics or metabolomics or some of these new technologies, we're already using artificial intelligence to help us understand that data and to find signals from the patterns. As I say, artificial intelligence is not new. It's, it's been here for a while. But what is new is that we now have the power and the computing for capacity to do some really cool things. And, and that power gives us the ability to do more complex tasks. 
So in toxicology, you can think about image recognition. Imagine that applied to histology slides where you're looking at different tissue slices and trying to understand whether one, one slice is uh, or one segment of, a, of an organ is normal versus abnormal. Well, a computer can be trained to do, to do that differentiation, making it much faster for a pathologist to review the, the slides from a particular in vivo study. On top of that, we've got inventions, or I, I should say requirements from federal regulators now to submit our data in electronic format. That's an enormous amount of data going into a central repository no one person can really digest that amount of data. So we're going to need artificial intelligence to digest and consume and to interpret a lot of the data that we generate. Perhaps it may even come to the point where we no longer need to do animal experiments. We can do things at a molecular level, looking at transcriptional or metabolomic or even proteomic level de uh, uh, changes that would inform us what would happen in a whole organism, for example. And understanding the complexities of biology is where artificial intelligence will really help us pick out the signals and the correlations that might lead to those new sort of inventions or new understanding and new knowledge. For those who don't really trust AI, why should they, and in this sort of application? I think there's a common mistrust of artificial intelligence because uh, for two reasons. One, I think people think that they will be put out of a job, that they'll get replaced by a machine. And I think that that arguably hasn't happened in, in history. What it has done is that we've become more efficient at doing our jobs so we can do more. The jobs have changed. So artificial intelligence isn't going to replace somebody. It's just going to make them better at what they do. The machines are only as good as the data that we give it. And so if the data is poor or we don't have enough information, then the machine is going to make mistakes. But I think recognizing that and using it appropriately um, to help us do our jobs more efficiently will ultimately lead us to some real good scientific breakthroughs um, that are going to be sort of groundbreaking in toxicology. Nigel, thanks so much for joining us today. No problem, and thank you very much for the invitation. Now we're in studio with Agnes Carmaus from Integrated Laboratory Systems. Agnes, thanks for joining us. So you have a session about integrated computational toxicology with in vitro assay systems. Why is this important? Yeah, we felt the need to put together a session to highlight this topic because I think that analyses and assay systems in general are advancing so, so quickly. Early in vitro assays were focused on looking at one molecular target and probing a very specific mechanism. And now we have these very advanced, multi-parametric, high content readouts that um, are giving us much more data and allow for much more complex analyses. And with that comes the need to develop computational toxicology approaches that analyze the data and provide outputs, giving us relevant information and not necessarily complex information. So it's no longer just a hairball and complex networks, but we can come up with easy and interpretable solutions um, from complex data with some of these tools. And we really wanted to highlight that for the membership of SOT. So in the session, you have a presentation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you'll be highlighting? Sure, my talk within that session is actually focused on the H295R steratogenesis assay, which is a system in which we can look at hormone production. Um, it's a human-based cell line, and we look at readouts for the ability to induce or inhibit hormone production as a result of chemical exposure. And the readouts from this assay include progestogens, progesterone, androgens like testosterone, uh, estrogens, of course, estradiol, and even glucocorticoids like cortisol. And we take all these readouts, there's about a dozen hormones measured in total, and we can do some really nice analyses to say not only did estrogen levels decrease because of a chemical being present, but we can also come up with inferences and predictions about what mechanism we think resulted in that decrease in hormone production. And so the content of the presentation will present multiple statistical and computational algorithms that we've applied to trying to predict mechanism based on having these multiple readouts. What do you hope members take away from your presentation? I really hope that more and more people dive into in vitro toxicology and 
computational toxicology, not to mention the intersection of the two. I think more and more scientists are becoming not only the toxicologist, but the data scientist as well. And we don't always need to have a separate bioinformatician. We can all do this. We can all work together to not only analyze the data, but also interpret and, and utilize the results of such complex systems. So I'm hoping people will find these complex things more approachable and um, will become interested and excited about this uh, new and evolving field. Agnes, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Now let's take a deep dive into the work at Hesperos, the human on a chip company that is accelerating drug development and discovery. Hesperos was formed to advance body and chip technology so it will become a common tool in toxicology and drug development. We are the original human on a chip company. We do primarily contract research for commercial customers and work with grants and contracts from government sources, primarily NIH. We operate as a service company rather than trying to sell devices due to the inherent complexity of the technology. Right now, about 11% of drugs that actually go into clinical trials end up being approved. If we could simply double that success rate, cut the cost of drugs in half. And so we believe by working directly with medicinal chemists, we increase the probability, okay, of that happening. There are thousands of chemical compounds in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the products we interact with every day. The team at Chemical Insights gives people around the world the confidence of knowing exactly what those chemicals are, how they may affect human health, and how to manage their impacts. Let's take a closer look. Underwriters Laboratories is a nonprofit safety science research and standards development organization. Our mission is helping to create safer living and working environments for people everywhere. We conduct and disseminate scientific research on public safety issues, and we develop standards for public safety in a wide variety of product and service areas. Chemical Insights is a research institute of Underwriters Laboratory. Much of our research is associated with chemical exposure, and we're concerned about chemical exposure because there are about 140,000 chemicals in the marketplace today that we use to manufacture our products. So it's important from our research standpoint that we undertake efforts to study those chemicals, how people are being exposed, at what levels people are being exposed, and if there's a hazard, figure out how to take the steps to minimize that hazard. Lastly, I want to show you a bit more about what the Society is doing to open the doors to the field of toxicology to more people. Let's learn more about the NCBAR pilot program. The Society of Toxicology has a strategic plan that is guiding all of its efforts and a key principle of that plan is science communications. So in order to educate the public about toxicology and to have a scientifically literate public, we must reach key influencers. And the Society of Toxicology has identified undergraduate faculty as key influencers who impact hundreds and thousands of students across places like North Carolina. So this is why we are focusing on the teachers to teach the undergrads. Before retiring in January of 2020, I also served on the North Carolina Association for Biomedical Research's Board of Trustees. And because of this position, I was aware that NCABR had been highly successful in developing outreach efforts to STEM educators in uh, North Carolina at the K through 12 level but the board had been urging NCBR to de develop a similar effort to go after undergraduates. Thus, it appeared to me that there was a real potential for a win-win opportunity here. By partnering with NCBR, SOT could help them develop an undergraduate educator outreach effort that they could use the, 
then as a pilot or an example of how they could work with other professional organizations to develop other STEM type outreach efforts. And on the part of SOT, it would help us uh, develop a communication effort to begin to have an educational and communication output to undergraduate educators. It is our hope that we will grow a network of faculty members and mentors who continue to work collaboratively to educate undergraduates here in North Carolina about toxicology, core cool principles and careers for the foreseeable future. They reach students who will go into life science careers and those who will not. The faculty who reach the students who will not go into life science careers will help foster a scientifically literate public by sharing fundamental principles of toxicology with those students before they graduate and enter the workforce. The faculty who reach students who will enter life science careers, we can reach them with information to help direct undergraduates to careers in toxicology more directly so that students who know about careers in medicine or veterinary medicine who may know nothing about careers in toxicology learn earlier in their college careers about an entire field that is available and open for them. The program will serve as an example of how SOT can work with similar organizations around the country and perhaps even globally to increase awareness of, uh, and appreciation of key toxicology concepts and the value of toxicology uh, to society. The program, a second, the program will introduce toxicology as a possible career opportunity to undergraduates and therefore uh, serve to uh, increase or enhance the pipeline of individuals entering into our profession. And finally, for NCBR, this is a great example of how they can work with other professional organizations to promote STEM education at the undergraduate level. Well, that's it for us today, but make sure to check back throughout the meeting as we'll have much more exclusive material on everything SOT. See you then.